Uh, so we've been trained to look for patterns. Uh, I think that's one thing that Rice is very good at. And I can, I can detect a pattern that I come to a place and Troy's there. <laughs> so I came to Princeton in 2005 and I was handed a thesis student by the name of Troy Shom. So it wasn't my choice, I have to say. Um, I show up here and it was Troy's my here. So, you know, it's, there's this pattern going on where, you know, I, I arrive in a place and this guy's in place and he's, he's I, I get to deal with him. And note I say I get, I get to deal with him as opposed to I have to deal with him because it's been a real pleasure for me. Um, I, and I will say that it's not a surprise to me that he's here because I actually encouraged him to apply for a job here for the fellowship um, uh, because I knew he would be a very good candidate for it. And indeed, it's been really nice to see that playing out. And I think this is a really nice opportunity to thank him for these almost two years of, of service. And I can also tell him now that the two years are almost over, that the fellowship here is very different from what these fellowships typically are. Um, typically, these fellowships are really sort of like the bottom of the feeding chain in a, in a faculty where there are people who essentially are slightly glorified um, Xeroxers in, in the faculty world where they don't get much responsibility, they um, are sort of told what to do and they, they learn how to teach that way. And here, frankly, they're thrown into the mix and take on an enormous amount of responsibility. And I think that you've seen that, that um, that's something that Troy's done. So, so um, before we even start, I'd like to thank him for his Wortham service. <laughs> Um, so, so Troy, uh, as you know, got his, got his MR from, from Princeton and did a very good thesis, a model thesis student, I might add, to those thesis students who are looking for models, talk to Troy. Um, uh, it was a, a real pleasure to work with him. He, is, uh, he, he worked for OMA after uh, being at Princeton and worked on the Milstein Hall project at Cornell, was a, a key figure in that, in that project and is now um, in partnership with uh, Rosalind Shea uh, in, the, in the office of Sham, Sham Shea, or Shea Sham. <laughs> Sham Shea is a little less like a restaurant. And <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Um, and I, I don't want to take up more time, but again, I just want to say that, that Troy's been a, a really key figure here, and it's a pleasure to get a chance to hear him now talk to us about his, his approach to architecture. So, Great. thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Sarah. That's a really nice introduction. And, um, uh, I really appreciate also that you uh, initiated this opportunity to um, have this exchange, which I think is, um, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to turn that on. I'm new to the big stage. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, which, which was, uh, um, which is already turning out to be an incredibly productive exchange. And this gives me an opportunity for so many of the students I think that I've uh, worked with and kind of came in here um, perhaps in the same way that uh, Sarah did. And they showed up and I was here and don't really know um, much about uh, what I'm interested in or what I'm up to um, when you guys probably think I'm sleeping, uh, uh, except for maybe just the few students that have uh, found their way uh, into my seminar have seen some of this work. So <clears throat> I'll get started. Um, so mass shape. <clears throat> uh, mass shape is an attempt for me to frame a discussion around a tension that has emerged in my work between one mass. And I should note that mass, and the way I'm talking about it, um, is not the mass that's found in weight or in the kind of sculpture of Richard Serra, concrete of Kahn, or discussions of phenomenology. But mass is an aggregation of pieces that begin with small scale, bottom up tactics, and through a multiplicity of systems or parts, can collectively make up a fragmented but coherent intervention in the city. It is the mass of the collective subject, the mass of the swarm. And shape is defined by the singular legible figure that through its hollow presence alone is able to participate with multiple subjects to formulate new modes of urban collectivity. It is the shape of specific objects. It is the whole shape that counts, not the composition part to part um, or part to whole. <clears throat> so while both strategies of dealing with the urban project seem to have certain potentialities, when, t when taken together, <laughs> uh, they open up the possibility for considering a more complex, multi-scaled, and perhaps ambitious response to the con uh, contemporary city. Um, to use the language Rainier Bantam used to describe the megastructural intervention of the 1960s, these projects um, both attempt to 
resolve the conflicts between design and spontaneity, large and small, permanent and transient. Each seems to um, operate effectively at opposing scales of intervention in ways that provoke for me possibilities of an investigation um, into perhaps productive reciprocal amalgams. So in mass, populations of individuals aggregate to make a unified whole while maintaining legibility of individual parts. The unit of the mass is the free individual whose choices and needs dictate the orientations and aspects. The critical relationship is part to part, and not the traditional part to whole. The strategies that produce these systems include, produced by these systems include extensive map typologies, field conditions, and landscape building. These extensive, potentially infinite systems are good at turning difference in an urban condition into graduated or incremental change, usually, usually using tactics uh, of extensive horizontality. These systems of mass tend to then have flexible boundaries that allow them to stitch seemingly seamlessly into the diffuse fabric of the modern city. Through hierarchies of <clears throat> uh, leveling and silence, through hierarchies of leveling and silencing the strong gestural hand um, of design, these mass strategies are able to foster small-scale accumulations of urban activity and collectivity um, that is generated by constituencies of uh, contingencies of occupation and use. Often, however, small incremental differences are not enough to deal with certain ruptures or disjunctions in urban context, program, or supported public publics of a project. Architecture in these cases must use its ability to negotiate difference and to choose sides with specificity instead of relying on the invisible hand of indeterminate contingency. In other situations, mass seems unable to produce a coherence required to give certain constituencies more legible collective identity against the background of the swarm of the city. In his two-page contribution to Ome's um, publication content, Robert Simmel's 12 Reasons to Get Back Into Shape channels a lineage from Maljevic through the minimalist art in the 1970s to construct the definition of shape that operates simultaneously as an opposition to the critical camp of Eisenman and Hayes, and more importantly, to the th um, provides a theoretical ground for some of OMA's recent work, and by extension, a proposition for future projects in the city. Shape for Simmel is easy, expendable, adaptable, arbitrary, but most importantly, empty. The emptiness operates for Sommel in a McLuhan-esque, cool way, requiring, the participor requiring active participatory subjects. It is these active subjects that fill the emptiness of the void created by, by shape with not yet seen forms of urban collectivity. Much of Sommel's critique emerges rather elastically from the minimalist art and some of the arguments that were drawn out in Michael Fried's Art and Objecthood, a text that is surprisingly shape-like and that in surprisingly shape-like ways has seen its critique of the theatricality of minimalism become the basis for an impossibly expansive um, body of formal art critique. In his analysis of the work of Judd and Robert Morris, he explains shape in this way. Um, the shape of an object, at any rate, what secures the wholeness of the object is the singleness of the shape. It is, I believe, this emphasis on shape that accounts for the impression, which numerous critics have mentioned, that Judd's and Morris's pieces are hollow. It is, the physical and, it is the physical and conceptual hollowness that Sommel uh, is able to appropriate and fill with, and fill with, the potential, with the potential to formulate these new possibilities of urban collectivity. It is not only the shape's closed, um, internal closed singlet that makes it operate, but its iconic specificity and ability to shape context through perception and orientation. Rosalind Krauss puts shape to work in her piece on Eisenman's House 10, uh, Death of the Hermetic Phantom, um, in looking into uh, the L sculptures of Robert Morris's, she, <clears throat> she notes that their power rests and that they do not contain any transcendental meaning, that the, their meaning derives from their interaction with the subject and the relation to the room and to the adjacent uh, shapes in the piece. She notes, their difference belongs to the exterior, to the point at which they surface into the public world of our experience. The difference is their sculptural meaning. It is the meaning that is dependent upon connection of these shapes to the space of experience. Is this power of shape to be conditioned by and condition context through performance and not transcendental meaning that makes it a seductive conceptual device for proposing new objects and possibilities um, of collectivity in the city? We see this at work in the Prada Transformer by Ome. Kuhlhaus describes it <clears throat> as a product of optimization in his well-known web broadcast for the press conference in which he explains, while flipping the model, 
<laughs> I'm not going to do an impression. This is, <laughs> this is the perfect, this, is, this one is perfect for a Prada fashion. So then it is housing that fashion. This is perfect for cinema. So the pavilion rolls and becomes the cinema. This is perfect for Prada fashion show, et cetera. Um, uh, anyway, I find this a little bit of a silly explanation. And um, the project uh, is more a demonstration of the singular empty shape filled contingently with various collective activities in an engagement with its intended public. The rotation serves merely as a cyclical erasure or resetting to allow a new mode of occupation to emerge. The project continually foregrounds the performance of rotation, the ability of shape to provoke and support these new communities of occupation. And we see this in an um, earlier project of OMA. Um, in the Hamburg project, you have uh, basically the same shape, um, rotated in uh, two different ways. Uh, one forming basically a sectional organization, one forming the kind of plan. And so the same shape is filled in two different ways. Um, and while <clears throat> it's easy to see the um, productiveness of, of shape at the scale of the building, as projects begin to scale up, shape's insistence on the singular becomes problematic. Often the size of a project in the city may require the logical-like legibility of shape to mark a presence for a contingency within the city. However, shape as logo, when blown up to the scale of one or several blocks, produces problems of an incomprehensible and relentless interior. What was a legible figure in the city, skyline, or a void in the fabric from Google Earth, becomes an incomprehensible, nearly sublime extensiveness when encountered up close. These problems of the relentless interiority and disintegrating context have been discussed at least since the 1960s introduction of New Monumentality by Venturi, Scott Brown, and others or clearly enumerated in Kuhlhaus' discussion of bigness, problems like distance from the core to the center, replacement of um, urban strategies that deal with the whole and the real with strategies um, of disintegration and disappearance. Um, <clears throat> with mass shape, I'm attempting to formulate a response within the framework of these two um, these two urban strategies, mostly as an acknowledgement that any large urban project is too complex to operate in a single mode alone, and that the demands of the project change fundamentally as you move up in size. So mass shape for me also uh, implies that we consider the implication, which um, uh, seems to be kind of undercurrent, uh, especially even here at Rice lately, um, the implication of massive shape, or that intervention into the city at certain scales um, as I stated, and as it fundamentally changes the nature of the tactics required. This question of a project that is too small for urbanism and too big for ar architecture seems to haunt our recent discussions as we continue to look at strat strategies for working with the big. For reasons including global pooling of capital, um, you, can, you guys can all name, uh, name them, I'm sure, uh, you know, realignments and growth of world economies, population pressures, et cetera, there seem to be a reinvigoration among some architects regarding how to operate the scale of the megastructure. And <clears throat> looking back at the, um, uh, the kind of, uh, his work on the megastructure, um, uh, megastructure urban futures recent past, you know, Banham, Banham speculates on um, several conditions that are uh, surprisingly similar to our own. And uh, when he talks about the um, preoccupation with um, the discussion of the megastructure, mega especially in the academic circles of the 1960s, above all, it, the megastructure, supported the feeling that architectural design could get into the act somehow. It could help resolve the insoluble problem of the modern city. At a time when social and statistical planning procedure were felt to be dissolving the sense of, uh, of the city as a physical artifact, when planning seemed to be drifting away from architecture, its supposed parent, these antecedents and precedents were felt to suggest that architecture and its skills were still relevant to the future of the city. In the guise of urban design, the exercise of architecture on a very large scale might bridge the gap between a single building and its disintegrating urban context. Um, <clears throat> so this is a way for me to, um, uh, in a way, try to frame uh, what are a series of projects that I'm going to show you. There are four projects, three of which I did in um, uh, the last uh, year, uh, since, year and a half since I've been here. Um, as I said, while uh, many of you guys probably think I'm uh, s sleeping or playing golf. Um, and, uh, um, and then the first one that I did um, considerably sooner while I was at Princeton um, uh, working with Sarah. So, <clears throat> um, and, and also I'll just say now, or I'll forget to mention, um, different projects besides the first one I've done in various sort of ad hoc collaborations that I've um, been able to uh, formulate um, 
and now it's becoming uh, a little bit more institutionalized in uh, in Sham Shea, but um, there's some uh, you know collaborations with Rosen Shea as well as the last two projects I did um, in collaboration, a kind of ad hoc collaboration with Caroline O'Donnell, who's at um, Cornell and has uh, uh, COD architects, Caroline O'Donnell architects. Okay, so. <clears throat> So the first project, um, and looking at the con these, these concepts uh, on a side at the edge of Manhattan, um, uh, I was beginning, uh, uh, I began by looking at this um, site along the East River. Because at the edge of Manhattan, um, you see this difference that I think is um, bound up in our discussion of the kind of singularity of the overall shape of the island produces a kind of edge, and the kind of multiplicity of the kind of um, aggregative condition that like, fills the, uh, uh, the grid of the city. This happened to be um, the site of uh, UN City, um, which um, is also was uh, at the time the largest undeveloped um, uh, old Con Ed site, the largest undeveloped piece of land in Manhattan. Um, and I'm going to move through some of this a little bit quickly, uh, just for time. But to begin, to begin with, uh, we, I began to look at institution instead of the kind of business development that um, uh, would have again, uh, you know, closed the edge of Manhattan, uh, closed the center of Manhattan away from its edge. I begin to look at uh, a more public institution uh, and imagine a, a new uh, CUNY uh, University campus um, uh, for this site. And so, as well, uh, there's a kind of dearth of park infrastructure. The largest park inf infrastructure in the area is in the UN, which has um, become a completely closed entity for security reasons. So um, between basically three million square feet um, to match the FAR of the existing development and to compete with that, um, we took that FAR in the park. Um, and there were certain um, shared programs that emerged um, uh, that both constituencies of the park and constituencies of the um, uh, university development could both use. <clears throat> and so this is the site, essentially. Um, uh, and you can see. Um, the ma m massive development. You can see that point if I do that. Yeah. The massive development was um, uh, on this property immediately adjacent to the UN, and then there was a kind of satellite uh, piece of property to be developed. Um, <clears throat> uh, quickly, uh, in, in terms of density and scale, um, and through several iterations, that emerged that a kind of ramping uh, typology could be used as well, because this area of town, because of the, it actually has quite a hilly topography. There's quite a bit of ramping, even the existing UN is um, quite a large plinth and uses ramping to bridge over. And essentially I was trying to combat the problem of the UN, which is um, that it essentially blocks, uh, as I said, the center of Manhattan from its edge uh, through its kind of uh, security apparatus, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so this strategy of ramping would allow to bridge over the FDR highway and allow Manhattan to meet its edge as well. Um, uh, introduce the um, what's the kind of atomized program of the project um, as then a kind of um, field of uh, uh, a kind of field of um, an extensive field of uh, programmatic zones that extended to the project and what um, what was interesting to me about this was the relationship between this kind of again this extensive field of the mass and then the total figure of uh, of the kind of ramping uh, infrastructure. And uh, there's a couple ways that, that um, those things got mediated. One was through a series of perforations that um, proliferated the <coughs> surface of the ramp. And these perforations brought light and air through the kind of dense uh, core of the project, and as well began to map a kind of um, perceptual relationship between the people in the ramp and the constituency of the university and the constituency of the, of the park below or above. And the kind of nodes I spoke about earlier um, erupted to basically form a kind of um, uh, uh, a super zone, su these kind of super zones that became um, both structure and infrastructure for the project and a kind of connective tissue that supported the, um, the ramp structure and as well uh, provided for this kind of shortcut circulation. Um, and, and then here you can see these kind of nodes kind of emerging uh, within that ramp. And so the plans, um, these are these unfolded plans that, <clears throat> that where you can see the kind of um, reiteration of the kind of continuity, again, the kind of continuity of the kind of ramping uh, project and, the, um, and the, what I call these kind of field of microzones that, uh, that fill in in, the, in between. And then you can see how this project um, in relation to this kind of uh, UN partner begins to kind of bridge this distance between the edge and the center as well 
have, it has two faces, uh, which is unique in Manhattan. And the one face on First Avenue um, maintains the street wall and is, um, <laughs> you know, a, a relatively um, fabric-based, cohesive, uh, or fabric-based, or tries to tie into the fabric by reinforcing the street wall and, and following the, filling the edge of the site, the way typical projects do in Manhattan. And then as you move through the project, there's this kind of layered, um, this kind of layered dense open space. Um, and then by the time you get to the edge, it opens up into a series of ramps that um, engage the edge of the city, the East River um, Esplanade that's uh, coming up, and actually um, there's a kind of uh, a ferry terminal down below. And here you can see in the section the kind of density of the, uh, the ramping structure and the kind of um, interlacing of these, uh, these urban parks, and these are the kind of ruptures in the infrastructure. And then so from, as you approach it from the ferry or as you see it from Queens, it becomes, it transforms from something that kind of maintains the urban street wall to this iconic um, object on the city skyline. <clears throat> the next project is a competition I did um, with Rosalind Shea for the uh, uh, Taipei Performing Arts Center in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Um, it's part of a series of competitions that um, are actually going on. Uh, there's the Taiwei, uh, Taiwan uh, Pop Music Center that um, Riser Mumoto just won. Ome actually ended up winning this competition. Um, that uh, Taiwan is funding to build these kind of cultural, um, these cultural art centers. Um, and there's actually, it actually is situated in Taiwan along this kind of string of what essentially are these um, uh, iconic art centers that are uh, uh, popping up along what they consider this kind of cultural axis. Um, and adjacent, uh, importantly, this, the unique condition of this is adjacent to the uh, Xilin Market, which is a um, uh, well-known, incredibly popular uh, night market in, in Taipei. And so more locally, the, the problem was that the um, project was in this old riverbed uh, that <clears throat> meant that very large-scale inf infrastructure um, or structures were built in this riverbed that essentially divided the city um, from the, small, the kind of older historical small-scale city on either side because this was filled in um, in the 20th century. And so the project began for us basically um, how to construct a kind of presence in the city that was uh, uh, not necessarily the simple uh, formal um, closed iconic um, box, but something that could um, open up and basically allow the night market to flow in and also um, uh, could have a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of new identity for this sort of a, what's essentially a multifaceted urban institution in the city. So we looked at a couple precedents um, trying to understand this because uh, it's quite a large project and um, we hadn't dealt with many things quite at this scale before. And um, so we looked at a kind of, not, the kind of 19th century model that I um, got to visit a couple weeks ago with the second years, the uh, Garnier Opera House in, in Paris. Uh, and this is a project in which the kind of these almost um, public urban spaces uh, are completely closed um, on the interior through a kind of like thick skin. And there's not much relationship between this kind of um, interior world and the kind of thick skin in the exterior versus the kind of much more um, lean and austere, uh, in the, what we're calling in, in, the, in the brief, the 20th century model of um, uh, Lincoln Center by Wallace K. Harrison, where there's a kind of plinth, and then each project, each form is clearly expressed. But by raising the plinth, it's a kind of closed, um, it becomes a kind of closed enclave from the city as well. So we actually looked at combining these two models, um, essentially raising the plinth and keeping the plinth um, basically for the services and what essentially are usually considered kind of back of house activities, and then expressing the theaters each individually. Um, to form both the kind of uh, formal structure and actual physical structure for the kind of raised plinth. Um, and you can see the project consisted of a kind of grand opera house theater, a typical proscenium theater, black box theater. It was um, a kind of huge multifaceted project. But essentially, the reason we raised the plinth was to allow for these, these shops, to basically is to allow for the um, movement from the night market to, um, so for the project to have this kind of presence um, in the riverbed, uh, on the kind of north-south axis, but for the same time for it to open up on the ground floor to reconnect the fabric below and to essentially bring in the activity from the night market. Um, and, and you can kind of see, so there's a kind of space for service, a space for the night market, and then this iconic roof form that's essentially produced um, very automatically by the uh, uh, programmatic needs in the interior. 
And so the night market could basically flow from this edge underneath. Um, so on the ground floor, you can see it's um, opened up and there's kind of shopping retail. There's like the base of the theaters at land. Um, and then there's this, the, this great hall that uh, all the theaters are oriented around. And it's the great hall that allows the kind of passage um, from one side to the other above the kind of activity of the night market below. And so here's the kind of uh, um, main entry. And you can see the kind of um, uh, lo what we call a kind of low resolution landscape on the roof that basically contains you know, rehearsal rooms, um, the various back of house programs. Uh, and at the same time has this kind of mouth that uh, can, can draw in the kind of grand crowds that you, um, you, get from the, you get from the train station and from the night market adjacent. And you move through the grand hall uh, to the other side of the project, which is the kind of um, uh, pedestrian and, uh, and traffic arrival side. And as well, the kind of linear, um, this low resolution terrain creates a kind of uh, visible sign for the project in a way along what's in a kind of extensive subway platform adjacent. And you can see the kind of uh, street life that would be possible. This is a kind of the kind of um, most informal of the theaters, a kind of uh, black box um, multi-form theater. Um, okay, <laughs> the next project, these are two projects that um, I did for the uh, European competition last year um, in collaboration with um, Caroline O'Donnell. The first, um, sort of gotten off my notes, but the first is um, uh, in Ballymun in, um, in uh, Ireland. And it's a kind of interesting site uh, in that if there's any U2 fans um, in the audience, um, there's a um, line from the song Running to Stand Still that says, uh, I see seven towers and no way out. Um, well, these are the seven towers uh, in the Ballymun development that, that U2 could see as they were growing up. Um, and so essentially there were seven towers. Um, you can see this is a 1960s uh, housing estate development that's being refurbished. Um, and uh, you can see that the seven towers, they look, like, they look like this. There's actually seven of them. And they were built, um, um, they're being torn down. And uh, they were built in memory of um, the seven leaders, uh, uh, seven leaders of the Easter uprising as a kind of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, what I think is a kind of interesting way to memorialize, not with a kind of um, singular monument, but with an actually like occupied housing uh, community, a way to memorialize the kind of uh, the martyrdom of these uh, individuals for the kind of uh, uh, the cause of their, their uh, national independence. And so uh, I was surprised to find that how um, uh, anxious everybody was to basically get these things torn down. And the only thing that was basically planned to remain, and this is our site, is this um, uh, existing power plant that was a kind of coal-fired power plant that provided district heating. And this was to be the site of the art center. And so here you can see that they're, they've basically all been demolished except for one at this point. And so uh, uh, our project um, proposed seven towers. Basically, that the seven towers were somehow important to the identity of this community. So in a way, it was... Um, uh, our project proposed moving the seven towers to the site, and it, it's a program that um, required both an art center and a uh, uh, 44 units of housing on the site that would be uh, basically done in phases. And so the bulk of the towers would be for the housing, and then the um, art center would be in this kind of um, uh, destabilizing base that, that I'll show you in a second. And so here you can see the kind of view. Basically, the rest of the community is growing up as this kind of new urbanist um, relatively banal stucco, uh, um, you know, new iteration of housing. And this is how the towers would kind of form this um, uh, new center for the community. Um, each tower, uh, there's basically three housing towers, a kind of artist tower, um, a tower for strictly energy production, and um, a tower for um, uh, artists, uh, art, or, art writers program that, 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 that they had uh, going on. And we decided we'd, we'd keep as the seventh tower the um, existing um, uh, the existing power plant, and we were really interested in um, uh, turning this from a site of um, energy consumption, essentially, to a site of energy production. And so, uh, a lot of what went into the form making and um, some of the proposals we um, described. Um, we're really around basically not, not just energy production in the sense of um, power, although that was some of it, but also energy production is the sense that there was a kind of 
big community center being built for, uh, for shopping. There was, of course, football, which is very important uh, in, in this kind of Irish suburb. And, um, and so these two centers were being built, and we proposed this would become a kind of third center um, of kind of basically energy production and artistic and um, uh, cultural energy production. And this is the kind of main road that uh, connects the two. And so we basically proposed this kind of slash off the main road um, that would open up the art center to the, that kind of traffic. So you can see we, we put these U-form uh, towers on the site and then uh, raised the ground on one side for the slash. Um, the slash came through. There's an existing building that basically blocked the project from the main street. And um, so uh, the, both the towers give it a presence, but also we had some control over this existing building. And so we're proposing basically cutting a gash in the exist, uh, it wasn't existing, but existing planned building. Um, cutting a gash in this existing planned building um, to uh, uh, open up the project to the main street. And then to form the towers, um, both for views uh, of the surrounding um, development and for the, uh, for the light. And so here you can see the, um, the gash that's created, and essentially these um, new six towers, uh, and the, and the seventh uh, old tower, and the way the art center then opens up to this main axis from um, the soccer fields to the shopping center. Um, and <clears throat> here you can see the gash. It basically also continually rises from one side to the other, so that you don't see the street on the other side, but you essentially, um, if they followed through on our planning proposal, you would see the, um, the sky on the other side. Uh, and then you can see the kind of roof gardens that um, uh, find their way because of the raised ground over the top. And so it opens up here. This is the entry and a kind of uh, amphitheater that allows the performance hall itself to become a kind of stage. Um, and then there's basically gardens on top that become community gardens for the um, uh, housing development that, that shares the site. And this is the community gardens for the housing development. And then the last project um, is a project that we actually um, uh, we actually got second in this comp this this entry. Um, uh, it's not in Dublin. <laughs> That's a mistake. But I guess this is uh, supposed to be works in progress. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, but uh, it's in uh, Leisnig, Germany, actually. Um, and uh, this is a project we call Urban Punk. And essentially. Um, uh, what we're uh, interested in doing is uh, the, the brief called for a rethinking of a, a town that was um, had an aging population and a, a population of young people that were moving out, and they didn't have the infrastructure or the jobs um, or a lot of the environment to support either the aging, aging population as, as they got older and more mobile or the... Um, uh, the jobs that would keep the young people in the community. And so there was a kind of call for a master plan. And what they really wanted was, um, I think, uh, a plan for where to build the senior housing in the town and how the senior housing could be connected to public transit. And what we really proposed was there was an um, existing fabric that was um, underutilized and um, only 15% uh, of it was accessible uh, to the aging population. Um, through uh, proper stairs or elevators, et cetera, um, because it's, the town was built in um, like 1068, I guess, is when it was founded. Um, and so what we really proposed was a kind of urban punctuation system, we called it, or a series of apostrophes. If you think of apostrophes as filling in gaps, and these apostrophes um, were essentially these series of shapes that could be adaptable to um, uh, any site that would basically or any void in these, in these kind of uh, blocks that essentially end up providing that infrastructure uh, for, the, um, uh, for the individual block so that the population could move back to the center of the city um, and, and reoccupy parts of the, the city that have been uh, inaccessible to them that forced them to move to low-rise housing uh, on the periphery. So as well, we proposed uh, stitching together um, some of the um, looser portions of the fabric to form these kind of figures that are merged around uh, various project, project nodes. But also stitching together, it was pretty surprising to us how little um, forest was left in this area. And um, you know, one of the very popular activities in the area is uh, walking, essentially, on the weekends. And so part of the project was restitching together through this insertion of some forest land and some orchards a kind of network of um, uh, walking trails. Um, and then here you can see the kind of incisions in the block. Usually there were two or three per block 
um, each one with a slightly different orientation. They could support the infrastructure of elevators, but also other senior services like, um, uh, you know, like recreation centers or certain health clinics, et cetera. Um, and so it, what that would do is, again, as I said, allow the population to move back to the center. Um, we also looked at focusing certain development around these nodes for the um, younger population. Uh, basically, there was a kind of existing bath that was very popular, and then we used, we proposed a kind of culinary institute. They were just hypothetical programs and a kind of business center uh, for how you might develop the ends of these different nodes where the um, space in the town allows for these kind of larger interventions. And you can see some examples of that. Um, and then we looked very closely at the core and developed a series of bike paths and walking paths to try to reorient the block so uh, each face of the block wasn't considered kind of equally as, as far as traffic goes. And you would get one face of the block that would be a bike path and one face of the block that would essentially be uh, for traffic. And the blocks included um, reinsertion of parking in the center of the block to make it accessible again um, because even though there's good public transit uh, in this part of Germany, it's um, not as good as it could be, I guess, in these rural areas, and a lot of people still do have cars. So um, it was one way to basically maintain, um, uh, to bump up the amount of, the bump of the population for each individual block, and at the same time, um, uh, uh, and at the same time provide this kind of accessibility to the kind of uh, older or, or younger population that wanted to have a car. Um, and so just a little bit about how these cores worked, uh, again, um, on top of the parking, there was kind of a proposed garden, so they would give access to this kind of garden. Um, you'd have a certain amount of collective program possible, and the, uh, the, the um, infrastructure and access via the back of the units to, to the, um, to the uh, individual units that I said um, would make 70% of the units now accessible via this new infrastructure, via the kind of 15% before. And as well, again, we're, uh, we're very uh, considerate of the kind of um, energy load that these things could have. And so we looked at a kind of typology of an existing um, castle in the area uh, that had these kind of deformed uh, eyebrow skins. And we proposed basically making, cladding our um, building with a series of these deformed eyebrow skins um, in a way that we could you know, integrate PVs. Of course, this is all very speculative if you know how these European proposals work. But um, there was a system in which the, the depth could be controlled, um, maybe it's too faint to see over here, where the depth could be controlled via the orientation of the shape um, in order to um, uh, fill the system. And so here you can see how it would play out um, in the individual block. Um, as well, you get a kind of um, uh, pass through from the street to the garden inside. And then here's the, the kind of community gardens that would be supported um, on the interior of the project. Um, so I don't really have a, <laughs> uh, a, a very broad conclusion, but I'm, I mostly um, wanted to try to frame a discussion of the work um, with my introduction and then present to you a series of projects that um, it's really the first time I've, um, uh, as I said, I've kind of brought them out of the closet and um, maybe that's a poor choice of words, but I brought them out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the office and, uh, and into the light and I uh, just kind of wanted to share with you guys that production. So. Um, I don't know, at this point I guess we can ask questions or have a discussion, I guess is the kind of intention of this. And I took a little bit more time, I guess, than I was supposed to, but um, I don't know. Yes, Perez. So, I do have a question. Uh -huh. It has to do with a the question I have has to do with a design convention mm -hmm. that is a bit banal, and we call Massey. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you ever looked at it in terms of its history. Because, I mean, for someone like Corbusier, it would be called volumetrie or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and usually the way it works is that it's, it's considered a, a preliminary moment, a non-architectural abstract preliminary moment for a project mm -hmm. that is used to kind of mass a project, and then it is more or less abandoned um, as, as its abstraction is abandoned, and then it's architecturalized mm. with ribbon windows, curtain walls, interfaces with the public, whatever. Uh, to what degree is this a kind of reinvention of, of massing, which, which until now was a totally banal moment, which is now is no longer when I see this, it's no longer a banana. Mm -hmm. um, 
So to what degree um, it is a re-delving uh, into this convention of Massey. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's that, um, where do you see the architecturalization of massing analogically speaking? Analogously speaking. So the last part again. <laughs> where, because here, it's the, the massing is so well so, uh, thought through right. that its architecturalization happens accidentally by the end. Right. It is not a moment, there is no moment of abandonment of the massing right. in order to architecturalize the project or mm -hmm. to make it architectural. Like, like it would be in a kind of modern framework, modernist framework. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, if one is, is to keep that analogy, mm -hmm. how would you uh, define the latter moment? Um. I think in terms of the, um, the question of massing, I mean, it is something that I, that I think does come into the discussion, the Chilmo's discussion of shape, and if, if, if I, I hear you right, it's a d discussion that could lead back to um, Hugh Ferris and his kind of drawings of the kind of 1916 um, zoning ordinance, et cetera. And I think in some projects recently, we have seen um, where Hugh, Hugh Ferris's projects have, um, uh, were thought to be hypothetical zoning envelopes that we were supposed to read. I think there are certain projects, and if we look at John, John Nouvelle's project for, say, like the tower at, um, at MoMA, for instance, or um, uh, perhaps uh, Astor Place, or um, there's an OMA project in Japan recently, that where the massing, that, that form itself actually becomes, or even, for instance, the, um, in some ways, the, the OMA's project on uh, uh, 23's 22nd Street, that envelope, that project that is the kind of project of envelope massing does become ultimately the kind of form of the project. And, and um, I think there's, uh, I don't know if that's a, um, a rewriting of a kind of modern sensibility, but it does seem like a new contemporary sensibility that people are comfortable with, uh, are comfortable with that as basically enough because the articulation, the kind of more complex or difficult articulation that you're describing of the kind of, okay, we did the massing and now we do the design, actually I think is seen as, um, or would be seen, I guess, through the lens of the argument I'm trying to make, would be seen as um, less critical to the uh, uh, performance of the project in a way. And um, what's, what I think is maybe more critical than the kind of articulation of the overall massing is something that starts much smaller and, um, and has to do with how you essentially fill that massing, right? And so one way to think of it is the mass could be um, essentially uh, a container, and you could either can fill that container with a kind of sand, a liquid or something, uh, which um, seems to be how we've sort of thought of, uh, or how SOMO will position shape. But in my argument, I think that's not enough, that it's not necessarily this articulation of uh, surface or or fine articulation of volume that you see from like the Hugh Ferris drawings to say um, Rockefeller Center, but it's something that uh, is maybe a kind of um, about uh, maybe even maybe there's some disjunction, but a kind of internal organization that could emerge besides just filling it with water or filling it with sand. That, that is what I'm trying to bring in this question of mass, right? So not mass is ma I mean I'm not really talking about. Mass is such a difficult word, maybe in a way that I, I picked quickly. That there's the mass is massing, but what I'm bringing in as mass is not 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 the kind of massing of the of the um, uh, mid-century. Is is this question of how you begin to articulate at the smaller scale? That's not from the whole to the part, but is essentially one strategy that is about the whole and one strategy that is about the parts, and they don't necessarily have to be hierarchically um, in a kind of relationship, but they can be in a kind of peer relationship. I, it was, I, I felt in a particularly lucky position to be able to see you take your thesis and somewhat retool how you're arguing it, which I think is actually a very um, interesting thing mm -hmm. for the, you know, I'm going to keep on my soapbox for the thesis student. Will I have a desk right after this? <laughs> and, um, of the, the sense of realizing that your, your project 
with this uh, really nicely becoming legible in these series of mm -hmm. projects was already part of your thesis, even mm -hmm. if you didn't fully recognize what the terms mm -hmm. might have been, or the terms have, have become sharper now as you're placing it in a bigger context of an argument going mm -hmm. on right now. So I think that's that's really nice to see how you're setting up this argument. One, one question I would have, and I really like the articulation of the mass and the shape, and, and you're sort of saying I'm going to sit, situate myself as a as, uh, strategy that, that takes this on. But what I wonder about is the sort of the limits of legibility, because you talk about the problem of legibility at the at the very big scale, and that's your critique of the shape argument. But I guess where's the where's the limit or the desirable legibility at the mass scale for you? Because in some of the projects, the individual components are legible, but not at the smaller scale yeah. that was implied by the beginning of your argument. Right. Uh, and I don't know whether if there were 70 towers, it would still be as effective a project, the mm -hmm. Irish project, right. for example. So where do you have some sort of uh, framework for offering you limits of legibility, not at the big scale, but in the in either intermediary or smaller scale that you're, you're taking on? Um, well, I guess a couple of things. One thing I just say about thesis in general, um, and um, my argument with my thesis students that now I get to make in front of everybody since I have the microphone is just that I think one thing that's been really productive for me in my thesis project is that uh, the struggle to produce a thesis and a project um, has is basically being able to operate in both worlds simultaneously is w why it's continued to be a kind of productive you know um, uh, a project for me and that if I had if I kind of had a thesis and hadn't articulated the project, I think, in the way I did and actually continue to do, as you probably noticed, uh, that I, um, uh, I don't think it would have been as, um, I don't think it would be as productive. So I, I'll just say that generally about thesis. The question of legibility, I think, one thing I tried, I had a really bad slide, um, and, and it's, it's, you know, I finally, I tried to find a million possible examples, but they all seem problematic. Am I, are you guys seeing this? Maybe I don't want to see this. Anyway, uh, but basically, um, I had the slide of, of the Corviale uh, to try to articulate this. And, and one problem um, I see about, see with legibility and the way these projects are discussed uh, is the problem of perception, and especially even with Google Earth now and the way we read the city, that there's something about these shaped projects that's very seductive at a distance. And that, um, that legibility is what falls away as you get close to it. And, uh, of the shape, right? And so the question of the legibility of the mass, um, it, it's something I haven't studied enough to really know uh, where that kind of perceptual limits are, but it's something that for me is very rooted in um, how I've noticed I've begun to critique and think through projects. It's the kind of simultaneous um, register between the kind of um, uh, basically, uh, nose on the glass perception and the kind of this kind of distance is something that I'm trying to struggle with. And some of the numbers basically came from the projects, you know, I have to say, uh, and not necessarily this thematic that I started with, but the kind of sensibility of, of trying to understand how you um, can essentially break up a block and try to understand how you can expand on thinking about blocks and multiple blocks and um, or beyond blocks in a way is something that's come up again and again and this is one sort of rubric that I've um, tried to operate operate with so I don't know if that doesn't really answer your question in a way but it's kind of says I don't know I guess <laughs> so yeah uh, Clover? Um, you just brought up multiple blocks uh -huh. I think everyone behind you has something too um, I was you know, that slide where it said massive shape, uh -huh. um, I was intrigued by it, and I don't know if you were earnestly talking about size, uh -huh. implying just a very big shape, because when you were trying to bring the two in terms of mass and shape together, I, I thought that it was about it being kind of very opposite conditions. One is being filled, edgeless, one is, you know, about kind of containment, but empty. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed that some of the samples I brought up of other people's projects, mm -hmm. To me, the legibility of shape depends on this critical point of where it's one side is about multiples and the other side is where there are so many it does become mass. And if you look at the OMA Art Center project where there are all these different shapes, uh -huh. 
I think it's carefully calibrated in terms of the number of shapes, right. so that you can still read them, but it's definitely multiples of shapes and not mass right. of shapes. Right. And I'm curious, like I would say the first project, the CUNY project, is that the, the volumes were so broken up that it's really about the, how it kind of comes together as mass. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, when I when I look at this, when I look at these projects through the lens of, um, and I go back a little bit through the lens of um, the kind of literalist or minimalist art of the '70s, um, I can't help but wonder about the tension between a kind of serial, like uh, field-based, uh, essentially kind of um, a kind of a, a kind of active multiplicity in a way, versus the kind of in a very dumb, uh, one after another of a kind of Donald Judd piece, right? Where you have basically multiple shapes. And so I feel like the OMA project is definitely more in that category of the kind of one after another. It's kind of a, just a, an accumulation of shape. And it's not really the mass that I described that actually has kind of agency between the parts. And in a way, it's more like the Robert Morris L piece, although there's, um, uh, um, uh, they're different shapes, it's not the same shape, but the kind of uh, powerful thing that, about that project becomes the kind of orientation and the kind of engagement um, between the subject and the shapes one after another and not the kind of active, formal active participation between the shapes as a kind of like field or strategy. I don't know if that's the kind of distinction you're asking about. Do you think that there, would you categorize like the aluminum boxes in Marfa as uh -huh. Multiples, or there's so many of them that it's clearly a field versus the Robert Morris piece, which I would consider as multiple. I don't read those pieces as fields. I read them as as multiples. I don't know because I don't. I see them as um, not uh, not implying ex like. Um, I see at least from. Um, when I see the work of Judd, I see it as not a, a serial extension that continue forever, but I see it as nine pieces, basically. And I think that distinction is, uh, as we think about multiplicity versus seriality versus field conditions or mass, I think are important to somehow keep track of. And uh, for me, I guess that's the difference between, say, seven towers in the Dublin project or you know three shapes per block in the versus the kind of field that was kind of in the first CUNY project, which is really the, um, probably the most articulate of the four projects of the kind of true mass and shape being suspended in the same project in a way. The other ones I think are much, could be critiqued as being much more like multiple shape projects, if that's what you're asking. I don't know. Yeah, Gordon? Um, so, many architects start their careers with uh, very small projects. Uh -huh. And uh, so I'm wondering, are you guys thinking Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, yes, we're doing a small project right now, actually. That's at an installation scale. Um, uh, there's um, my partner has a a grant um, with which they were able to buy a house for five hundred dollars in in Detroit, and um, the, we're doing an installation to this five hundred dollar house. Um, it's essentially a kind of um, video, it's a video theater for video art. It's gonna be donated to an um, arts foundation in Detroit. Uh, not really, it's arts foundation. It's really like three guys that have bought up and now have an arts foundation, but it sounds important, <laughs> I guess, in this context if I say it's an arts foundation. But it's, a, it's an arts foundation, but they, there's, been a, there's a, basically a, um, a program that's gonna live on. But So that, I guess, that's the desire, I mean, to actually build and to start at a, um, small scale and I have, um, one thing for me personally is I have a background in uh, detailing, drawing, actually like um, uh, what some of you guys uh, might consider like boring sort of CD work production. <laughs> uh, so for me this, is, uh, this work has always been, when I got to Rice, this was an opportunity really to um, operate in another direction, that to operate conceptually uh, um, with projects that I didn't get to operate with um, on my own, I would say, in, in a kind of studio environment. So it's coming back as we're getting this project, um, uh, and then we've only had a couple other sort of, it's slow market, <laughs> we've had a couple other interests in smaller projects, but the, the installation, I guess, um, and in that we are dealing more with what I would say is a kind of, um, uh, it's 
uh, in Michigan, so we're dealing much more with the kind of fabrication and um, the, the customization and even uh, seriality that, that that kind of fabrication produces. And so I'm not, that's, probably just, that's in process. And if I really wanted to show working, I would show maybe just like six sketches of that or you know, rhino shots of that that we have, but that's kind of in process now and what we're working on. Uh, Kurt? I guess uh, part of that comes from trying to understand about the kind of, again, the limits of a kind of perceptual difference between understanding that there is uh, a system that there is a potential limitless extension and how you perceive that limitless extension when you're within it. But at each individual moment, there's a kind of uh, specificity and uh, completeness uh, uh, responsibility, I guess, of that individual moment to its kind of location and how you sort of reconcile the kind of extension, the kind of endless extension that you can read that produces this kind of perception of mass with um, the kind of necessity for a kind of um, a response to kind of local conditions. And I guess that's what I was trying to get at, um, and I went through it, I know, quickly, but you know, with these some of these diagrams that I worked through where I would look at the individual situation, and these are two of... Um, you know, two of many basically situations that emerge in this plinth, uh, in this plate of a, a ramping plate. And, uh, you know, each one uh, responded both to these kind of solar orientations, um, the flows of uh, air through the site, and um, connections of um, visibility, and um, with, but still had to maintain their kind of participation as part of the overall system. So, uh, I don't know. I, I have a question in relationship to how you represent your projects uh -huh. that for me somehow it gives me a hint uh -huh. uh, of how you're actually treating your concept right uh -huh. from the beginning of the project where you were talking even about monumentality perhaps right. in your UN, in, in the Kuni project and in the Ireland project or even in the, in the, in the Spunk, Punk, in the Punk project yeah. there is a certain notion of fragmentation or par partial figures mm -hmm. that start to emerge even in the renderings, right, of the seven towers. Right. Perhaps it was because of the projector. It was, it was hard, actually, to read them as one single figure or uh -huh. shape, right? So there is a certain demat like dematerialization uh, of, the, of the overall project that exists mm -hmm. in the perspectival view when you mm -hmm. represent the project. But when you show them in plan, right, they always take a different color. The right. edge, the perimeter, yeah. the delimitation of, of the boundary of the mm -hmm. project, the shape takes like takes command in the plan, but in the perspective starts to disappear. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you are interested in, like thinking the project in a in a certain way in a Cartesian space as a figure, as a shape, but in the in the experiential or in the phenomenological space of the of the user, that project, that shape starts to disappear in a much more smaller way. Uh, I think it's something that's I think um, it's an issue that's active in, in the work. I mean, to, to, think, to think through, I, I think any time you're thinking through this problem of shape and this sort of um, the arbitrariness, but at the same time the kind of specificity of these kind of shape projects, uh, what really I think, but it's hard to design, which is why maybe you only see it through like renderings or other sort of... Um, uh, representations where you can show effects more. There's always a tension between the specificity um, of the kind of design hand and the kind of dematerialization of effects as you like start to look at material, surface, and, and as you even look at kind of like, you know, the parapathetic subjects like moving through the project, et cetera. Um, 
uh, so that's that's an interest of mine and um, something we talk about a bit in my seminar. Uh, I haven't really ever figured out how to design based on that. <laughs> it's more about, uh, for me, designing uh, based on um, what you're describing. You probably see in the plans or other representations and then unpacking that design in terms of what effects it's producing versus designing for the effects, if that's what you're asking. I mean, I just think that it's an extremely interesting mixture mm -hmm. between we would see, like, we would be like a SANA project, right, uh -huh. and an OMA project, mm -hmm. operating in different systems of representation. Right. And I think these are two very difficult animals to merge, right? right. But your your Coney project has some of those dematerializations of the plan of yeah. the volume of the box that we would be able to find in SANA, but not in the way that you're representing it, right? right. Everything is totally legible. When we talk about forms or shapes in the city, we see them like the way that someone represents it is even through the caricature, right? Uh -huh. We're out of context. And you're able to dematerialize that. And this interplay between the mass shape and the dematerialization, I think it's a very interesting place to be playing, right? Uh -huh. Because I, I think that, I don't know, we cannot see it articulated anywhere else. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting place. Okay. Work in progress, discussion in progress. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.